Thank you, everybody. Um, it's great that you came in such counts. It's I think it's fourth season, right, uh, of machine learning meetup. So uh, still new people here. Today I have prepared talk for you about my experience with early stage machine learning startups. I am in this crazy ride like two years now, and specifically for this talk, I decided to just cherry pick some interesting problems and actually lessons learned, the experience during last few months. I hope you can uh, maybe transfer some of these to your projects, and I believe we can have some nice discussion around all the topics I will raise here. So before I will jump into the, I would say, technical part, I would like to a little bit talk about my story, how I got to the startups, and what we actually do in uh, Simple Finance, which is our startup. So. Back in 2016 or 17, I was a uh, research lead in uh, Cessna and we were working on a lot of problems. One of them was uh, actually implementing deep learning approaches for uh, uh, image search. We transformed all the image web search of Cessna to a deep learning version. So there was a plenty of experience in the team about deep learning on images. At the same time, in California, DC Venture Capital Fund, which, is, uh, which are guys who are investing into the machine learning based startups, basically decided that they will um, also invest to some companies which send uh, CubeSats to the orbit. So, and CubeSats are small satellites uh, which can basically uh, make imagery of whatever you, whatever you want. And they thought it would be nice to just join do those two great technologies like deep learning and, and, and the imagery. And this is how I get to the, to the project originally. What was my surprise when we didn't have any product in the beginning and I was asked like to research what we could do and uh, I would be honest with you, I was pretty much frustrated because I wanted to code and instead of coding I was like searching the product, what we could do. To give you an idea what we were searching for, for example, one idea was just uh, find a good place for a solar power plant where it could be built this, this, kind, of, this kind of facility or we were thinking about just checking if the, if the properties were destroyed by a tornado and help insurance companies to just, just uh, check the false claims of, of insurance. Or even more crazy ideas like checking the tubes uh, of the oil companies if they are leaking or not, just checking if there is a spill of the oil under, the, under the, those tubes which are going on the ground. But at the end, we end up with, with a real estate in the, in the US because you know, if you look on, on, on the real estate in the US, there is a plenty of data. The industry itself, is, um, there, there wasn't such big like revolution in terms of technology, so there is a plenty of low-hanging fruit. And uh, last but not least, it just generates a lot of, uh, a lot of money. It's like 30% of GDP of, of US and uh, like annual revenue is like almost like 600 billion dollars. So we decided, wow, this is like great, great opportunity to jump into this market and do something. And uh, specifically, uh, we focused on one task, which is let's try to predict the, um, the price of the property. This is something which is uh, done a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases manually by uh, people who are called appraisers, who just come to your home, measure everything, calculate everything. They are not scalable, they are not accurate, you cannot compare each other because they are simply inaccurate. And we decided that um, we will automate this task and use the machine learning for it. There is a plenty of... Um, plenty of subjects which needs those, uh, those predictions. There are banks and insurance companies who use those predictions for the product they, they have. And at the same time, there are investors who just invest to a big portfolio of, of real estate and they want to know like, what's the price in a concrete time and you, you cannot have like one appraiser who will just uh, die calculating all the prices of tau your thousand properties. You know, it would take like 100 years. So you need some, some technology which is uh, this kind of machine learning stuff. So that was the idea and we started pretty wild. So we started to scrape data, build our own data set. We didn't know much about, about uh, the domain itself. But we started to ask to those, uh, to those banks, and, and we actually tried to ask banks to just do, do a proof of concept thing. So 
it usually works that they send us some properties, we do the calculations, send back uh, our predictions, and they somehow internally evaluate it if we are good or not. And the message was quite clear from everybody. You have good predictions, so can you scale to nationwide? Well, of course not, because we were just, there was like two dudes in, in Brno who are scraping, sp scraping all the day data from, from some, some resources on internet. We, we were basically stealing the data, so we just thought, okay, we are like small startup in early stage, so. And at that point, we started to realize that we are actually missing some, some good products, some, some good business strategy. Everybody from, from the team were actually from Czech Republic, and we didn't know the market. And we, we were quite desperate at the time, and everything changed, I would say, last summer, when we uh, succeeded to hire our CEO. I'm not sure if you tried to hire a CEO in California for, for a machine learning based startup, but it's like mission impossible. It costs a lot of money, I mean, like you can imagine hundreds of thousand dollars in a few months, just, just the searching without a guarantee that some, somebody would be searched. Because those people are usually really happy with where they are and, and the transition is like too slow. But we were, we were really lucky. We, we hit the guy who was actually working for our competition and decided that he, he needs some new challenge. And he, he joined the team and what he brought specifically is, is a new vision of the product. So um, what, he, what he think and what he, what he brought is that in the in, in, uh, in US, when you take a mortgage for your property, for your home, it takes a very really long time to close it. it it's like, I don't know, in, uh, in uh, average it's like uh, 50 days when you need to, what, what, what takes you uh, from just asking for the mortgage to close it. And there is approximately $4,000, which is like 40% of, of the costs for the mortgage, which can be which can be reduced if the process would be shorter, if it would take like five days, for example. When you have a look on, on a large scale, on, on mortgages, you will find out that, that the yearly, it, it takes you like 207 million wasted days, and it's like 36 billion dollars, which you can just cut off. And it's like huge opportunity. So we decided to take uh, our valuation engine, which very well predicts predicts the sold prices of the properties. We actually buy the data, we didn't scrape anymore, so we actually found partners who, who provide data. And we build the product. And the product is just mobile app, it's B2C, and which helps you really to close the mortgage really fast. It, uh, it give you, gives you some insights onto uh, what, what mortgage you can afford, which, which mortgage you cannot afford, what are expected prices of the properties, and it really guides you through the process, and it takes like a few days to close it. And it makes like big difference. So that's our product, um, but I don't want to talk about product anymore because I just wanted to show you like the lifespan of the project and now I would like to really focus more on on the research part because we obviously hacked a lot and did the research a lot before we, we are right now in the process of getting to the production so I would like to look back on, on the research part so before I will jump to it first lesson learned uh, which is kind of a cliche but it works really really a lot just cool technology doesn't mean anything if you don't have like really good product and business strategy. And I, I mean, it, like if, even if you want to be happy as a researcher, you want to work on like reasonable product. So this is about. And now let's let's jump into the into the research part. I will sip a little bit. Okay, okay. So. Uh, how we do the research? We have pretty much basic flow, uh, which probably have everybody of you if you work in, in a like machine learning based company. So we spend a lot of time on a data cleaning, uh, actually merging together, together the data sets because we have multiple providers, which is kind of painful. Uh, next part is the modeling, which just ensemble a lot of models together. So. Um, 
again, we try to combine um, neural networks for unstructured uh, and also unstructured data mixed with gradient boosted trees, etc., etc. And the last part of, of, of this flow is about filtering the results because you know you don't want to have predictions which are actually crappy and close a, uh, like a mortgage on it because you, you would at the end lose the money. So you want somehow quantify the confidence of the models and uh, this is about. And this process is actually like never ending loop when you end up with, with the modeling, you, you just start again with, with like some new knowledge, you adjust the data, etc., etc. So each of these parts will generate some, some nice topics I would talk about today. And before I will jump to this, uh, one issue we were solving is that we, we wanted to well, on one side, explore quickly, do the research, and on the other side, we wanted to be somehow consistent with the production. We wanted to have a good flow and some stable code base. And those two things go on, I would say, uh, two directions. Uh, so what we uh, actually learned is to do kind of hackathon style. So we have like two or three weeks of hackathon when we do a lot of research. And then we actually cherry pick some interesting, interesting things which in, we integrate in like really git flow measure to our uh, to our code base, which is at, at one point it's it helps us really to find out some interesting things, and on the other side it helps us to like keep the code base kind of stable. Uh, we use a lot of uh, paper mill stuff. Do you know who knows paper mill and commuter? Just raise your hand. Who, who use it? Who use it in production? Almost nobody. So it's really cool. I recommend you to have a look on this. Uh, it's actually um, Netflix, uh, Netflix idea who, who use it in production. So if you have Jupyter Notebook and you want to run it as a script with parameters, you can actually use the pay paper mill, which is actually not nothing else than, than a Jupyter Notebook with parameters. The nice thing is that uh, at the end, the, the, the output from running this script is executed uh, Jupyter Notebook, so you, can, you have kind of like interactive log, and it's really suitable for researchers because something don't work well, so you, have, you can have to the log, you can have a look to the log, but you can have um, there are some graphs and really in some interactive stuff, interactive stuff, and you can just then take this interactive log and run it again and do the debugging, which is really like nice way how to how to how to operate in a research, I would say. So this is my uh, next lesson uh, using quick hackathon cycles, uh, which are shifted with, with, with integration of some nice ideas, powered by uh, paper mill notebooks. Really recommend you. Now, let's have a look on, on our data to give you some idea uh, what we are uh, what we are using in uh, in our research. So um, we are, in, as I said, in the US, we have like 150 million properties nationwide. Um, and we, right now we are in California. Uh, if you would look, for example, in the last, last three years, we have like 1 million sold properties. And like every day we have uh, 30,000 new, new properties which are, uh, are listed, which means are for sale. And um, those are very interesting ones because um, those are highly probable would be used for, for the mortgages. And regarding the data, as I said, we are mixing like two providers of structured data. You can imagine like hundreds of structured features. We try to combine also imagery information to, to our modeling. And uh, in the past, when we were in a process of ki kind of hacking, we experimented with a lot of uh, other data from, from the maps about the crime, about the quality of schools, which is um, quite correlated with also with the prices in the area of, of the properties. So this is our data set. And the task, once again, is about taking those features and try to predict the actual price of the property. Now, uh, as I said, um, we have multiple data providers and it generates some, some problems. One of them is uh, that uh, you need to have kind of focus on, on feature, feature selection. So for example, 
Uh, when you look on our, our structured features, like here is our 400 structured features, you can see that like almost, almost like one fourth of, of the features have really low coverage. I really recommend you also in your projects to cut off those really low coverage features because then your models will tend to overfit on those low coverage features. So this is one thing we obviously need to do. Then um, here we look at, uh, on, on a clustering of continuous features. So this is like a person correlation. And when you have a look more in detail, you can see the prefix is uh, there are two providers, Atom and First American. And you can see there are multiple duplicated features from both pro providers. I really recommend to take some time and unify those features. Uh, there are two reasons. One is uh, interpretability of your models, because if you have like four similar features and just your client will ask, what this feature do for your model, and you have other four duplicated features with the same meaning, it's very hard to say what is the real influence of your feature. Another, another thing which surprised me a lot is when you unify the features, and even if you use like gradient boosting methods, which are quite robust, um, with regard, um, quite robust uh, with like noisy data, it improves the result. And uh, so this, this unifying is quite low, low hanging fruit uh, for you if you have duplicated features. With categorical features, it's harder. Who, know, who knows from you uh, like conditional entropy methods or a CLU methods? Just raise your hand. Okay, again, uh, it would be something uh, new for you. So I really struggled how to do clustering around categorical features because you know they are not ordinary. So you can it's hard to use like some uh, Spearman correlation or whatever. And what you can what you can actually do is uh, you can calculate entropy of your categorical feature, and then you can calculate conditional entropy of your categorical feature X based on categorical feature Y, which actually in a human language will say you how, how much Y explains the X, and then you can do the subtraction. And this is like asymmetric measure uh, between those features, and again, it really, really worked well for our problem. So when we look to the categorical features which are related to the location, you will again see the mix of, of the providers together, uh, which are clustered by this, by this measure. And again, it's a good idea to unify those information. And here is my third lesson, like really um, spend some time on, on your features and, and make the data set cleaner. I, I know, again, it's cliche, but it's so long, low hanging fruit that it would be like, it's so easy to do it. Now, I will talk a little bit about the labels. Um, we uh, actually use uh, salt properties to train our models. So, uh, so if you imagine like last three years of salt properties, we take those as a training data and we try to predict those salt prices for concrete date. So this is, this is the way how we train the models. When we look more closely to, uh, to, the, to our targets, which is the, the, which is the salt price of the properties, and this is the distribution of the salt properties, oh, oops, uh, this is the distribution of salt properties from last three years in California. You can see this huge long tail, these are expensive properties. But this, this huge long tail will generate you quite big error during the training, which causes that the training is slow because, you know, models need to fix these big errors which are generated by this long tail. So good idea, for example, could be just scale it to a logarithm scale, which will help you to train faster, and at the end we will get um, uh, more precise models. I even can you recommend, if you use neural networks and you use all the batch normalization stuff, etc., and you have input features which are really like, with this, this long tail, use kind of robust scaling, for, for example. There, there are many, many of those scaling in scikit-learn, and it can help you also with the, with the neural networks. Another problem uh, with the training is that our training data are distributed across time. So you cannot just simply take one property which was sold in 2017 and one property which was sold in 2019 and compare them because uh, the prices are changing during the time. So we actually use kind of house price index 
to solve this problem. So this is the price index in California during the years. You can see here the Great Depression uh, from 2007. And this green guy is just uh, specified to LA. And when we have a training data like this, so each, each dot is one, one property sold across, across uh, from like 2010 to 2019, what do we do actually first? We normalize those properties according to time to some concrete date and then those properties are comparable uh, to each other. And then we train the models. If you just if you would just use this, this time index and let's say the property would be sold in 2011 and you would just shift the, the sold price to today using the index, you would probably generate like 13% uh, error. I mean like if you calculate how much you are off the real sold price. But uh, if we use just our ensembling, we are actually correcting this index and we get to like 1.9% uh, of the era of, of the prediction, which, are, which is I think quite close to, to just like human variance because people are probably not more consistent than this. My takeaway here is Whenever you have some label, it's a great idea to incorporate into this some of your prior knowledge you, you know about your domain. For us, it was we know the index of the sold prices during the years. Um, for example, we have been we have using uh, we have been using log scale to help us with training. You can, for example, normalize the sold prices by the size of the property. All those tricks will um, just force the models to use maybe different set of features and if you would just ensemble a, a few models with different tricks, you will get more robust modeling. And specifically when you have this task, when, when the accuracy matters, it's a good idea to try it. So my lesson four here. Now, the big problem uh, with actually uh, time distributed uh, data sets is and specifically when you have third party provider of those data is that uh, some, some people uh, from the provider side can mess your data. And I will give you concrete examples. So imagine you have sold property from 2018 and all the features. And then in 2019, somebody from the provider side come to the data and adjust some features according actually the sold price, which was in 2018. So this, this will cause that suddenly this feature which is such adjusted is cheating because you ingested the, the knowledge from the future. And actually it happened to us. So here is, uh, here is some feature which I would call here assessed value which, is, which was in the first side it seemed like a really nice feature which is quite correlated with, with, our, with our label. Uh, but when we analyze it more, actually, when you look, um, and each, each dot here is the property, right? So when you look on, on this feature in 2018, somebody came and adjusted it uh, according to last sold price. So the, here is this like diagonal line. In 2019, uh, not this change uh, was not done yet. So there is some like spread uh, and not like uh, this huge correlation. And what will what will cause it, uh, you will train, if you would train on data from 2018, just models will overfit on this, on this diagonal line, but when you will give those models just your testing data from 2019, it will be fucked because, you know, uh, there is a huge spread and the model is overfit on this line. And it's really hard to find out, so I don't have really like um, a good much good advices uh, how to uh, how to find out those problems. Maybe two of them. So first is just train your model on your data set and have a look on the most influential feature and then just do your analysis. Just play around, uh, look on, on the time and you m maybe you will find out some, some of those issues. Same as we did actually. The second thing is uh, you can set up your data set in a way that it will help you to detect those problems. And I will talk about it uh, now. So uh, why data set setup? What, what it means actually? So what, what do we wanted to solve with kind of this setup? So there are two issues. 
we wanted to, uh, to address. One of them is we are actually training the ensembles uh, of models. So you cannot just have train test valid uh, split on data. Uh, and I will explain why. So this is one, one reason why we just care more about data set setup. And the second one is we wanted to simulate our production as much as possible. And I would like stress it a lot because it's like the core. Uh, just try to simulate our production. And what we did actually, we tried to put our testing data to the future from perspective of training. So let's have a look on this. Uh, we have uh, like two bunch of data. Uh, one, one bunch was just for testing, another was for training. The major difference between those is the time. So the testing set is uh, like younger than, than 2019, and the, uh, the training set is in the past from the point of view of testing data. And actually, the, the training data are then split to training validation and training ensemble. Why? We have some particular models like neural networks, gradient boosted trees, and those are training on uh, this, this chunk of data, train model and validation. But when we want to build an ensemble, you want prediction, and we will use the predictions of, of these particular models. We don't want to have a predictions from training data because those are biased. Those would look like great because they were in the training of, of the particular models. But in the production, you will get like new data, and the, the predictions would be much more shitty than like getting them from, from a train, training set which was used for training those particular models. So we actually. That's why we need a special training set for the ensembling. You cannot just build the ensemble on the same training data as you build your particular models. So these are like two, two things we, which we actually focus on. This approach is called blending. How many of you know blending or stacking? Those are the approaches for, for ensembling. Okay, a few of you. So. I really um, uh, recommend you, if you would like to ensemble models, which is like a really popular approach, even with solving like Kegel competitions or whatever you would do, because ensemble generally brings you some extra half percent of accuracy or whatever it is. Just take care about this stuff. And a lesson from this is really simulate your production as much as you can, specifically if you, if you need to bother with time. It's like hell, so this is it. Now I will continue with modeling part. Uh, as I said, um, we, would, uh, we do a lot of ensembling, and I already also said that we use neural networks and gradient boosted trees. The reason why we combine those two is actually how, how those approaches work with, with the data itself. So when you have neural networks which are quite sensitive to structured data and are never beat the, the gradient boosted approach, but you can use neural networks to build a kind of rich embeddings, and when you look on how neural networks work, neural networks project data into the multi-dimensional space and do a lot of combination with the features, uh, in difference to, uh, uh, to a gradient boosted methods which actually do the cuts in the data. So those are kind of complementary, complementary approaches uh, which help each other. And that's why we actually try to try to accommodate both of those. And we actually use also deep uh, neural networks on, on images. Uh, so this is another extra, extra layer. Well, now, uh, since we are pretty much short on time, uh, I will give you a chance uh, to decide what I will talk about. So now uh, we have two options. I can talk a little bit about uh, tricks um, adopted from fast AI um, to how to work with a structured data with a neural networks, or I can talk about a little bit about processing of images with a neural networks in the project. So who is for uh, structured data with fast AI approaches? Just raise your hand. Fuck. And who is for, <laughs> for <laughs> images? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people actually um, decided for structured data, so I will continue with structured data. Nice. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect it. I, I thought that uh, everybody would vote for images, so I even didn't prepare for this. So, <laughs> um, well, as I said, uh, with, a uh, with a neural networks on structured data, we, the main focus. Uh, 
which is the similar as a, as a tabular approach in FastAI. We really build rich embeddings for categorical features. This is like, like I would say, the, uh, the big, biggest benefit of neural networks here. And we adopted like two nice approaches, how to adjust your neural networks uh, to run faster on a data, which is actually adopted from Leslie Smith paper, but uh, like evangelized by uh, Jeremy Howard in, in a fast AI course, if, if you know it. How many of you know, know, know fast AI? Just, I'm curious, guys, sorry. Good, so um, he uh, proposed uh, several tricks. Uh, First of them, I, I need to check uh, what is the name of the trick, actually. Uh, it's learning rate range test. And uh, basically, it helps you to pick best learning rate for, for your uh, problem. So uh, what Jeremy proposed is uh, to take your neural network, take your data, and then uh, take first batch uh, with uh, really like low learning rate and do first uh, forward pass and back propagation and, and check the loss. So it's here. And then each iteration actually, you will increase the learning rate until the, and, and calculate the loss until actually the gradient will explode and your loss will be just huge. And then they say, you can pick basically from kind of this range. I will uh, actually leave here in a, in a slides reference to original paper so you can read m more about it. But this is the like uh, recommended uh, learning rate range where the gradient is actually the biggest of, of this curve. And it speeds up, it speeds up training. And there is, this is just pure like uh, empirical thing, but it works. So it was nice, we use it. And then uh, he approached one cycle, one, cy one cycle training. So when we train the models, so here we have iteration of training. First, we start with a really low re learning rate, which is actually uh, this guy here. And during the iterations, we increase the learning rate into some uh, huge number, which would be, uh, sorry, which would be uh, this, this guy here and then decreases again. And he says that it, it uh, actually really speeds up uh, the training. He, they, they showed example with, with actually ResNet and training of, of uh, image deep learning models. And they got the same state-of-the-art results with this cycle approach uh, after 10,000 iterations when the original result was uh, achieved after 60,000 iterations. And they said that with this approach, after, after 50, 000, 50 iterations, just 50, they got to really almost the state of the art results. It was like difference of one percentage point or something like this. Very impressive. Uh, with this also goes um, kind of momentum thing. So you can, uh, you can uh, adjust the momentum of your learning rate when you are training. So here in the beginning, you have really low, uh, low learning rate and you have a huge momentum, which means it's really conservative to, to like, uh, for exploration. Uh, but during the time when you get to this point, the learning rate is really huge, so you explore a lot and the uh, momentum is really low, so you really can, uh, can do uh, unregularized exploration, which helps you to just jump off the settle points, and you end ends up with a really low le learning rate, which will help you to adjust the solution at the end. And it works, so uh, I recommend you to have a look on fast AI course. Here is here is the link, working link on the paper, um, and my lesson learned around categorical features. Unfortunately, I will skip the the images, uh, so like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will tell just the le uh, lesson learned from, from the image processing. I was surprised that it didn't improve much uh, the actual metric, which is like absolute percentage error of the predictions. So I mean how many percents you are off from real salt price. But what it, what it improved a lot was the variance of the predictions. So uh, images helped with just this long tail properties on both sides uh, of the spectrum and bring some extra information about the neighborhood, which actually helped. So this is it. Now I will jump to gradient boosted methods. Uh, 
Uh, just quick recap for you guys. So when we have um, gradient boosted forest, so these are uh, a few decision trees, and when you do uh, evaluation, you will just take your example and uh, let it flow through these decision trees. In each node, there is some, some question about the size of your feature. And at the end, in the leaves, there are some scores which will be summed up, maybe weight, weightedly summed up, and you have the prediction. And you, what you can do with the prediction, you can calculate the, the loss, the objective function of the prediction, how off you are from what you would like to get. And you can calculate also gradient and second derivative of those, uh, those predictions. And actually, in gradient boosted approach, those first and second derivative are used to build another tree, uh, which will improve the uh, whole forest. And is somehow proportional to negative gradient of, of, of the error, which is uh, quite intuitive, because the negative gradient usually points to some minimum of the function. I don't want to go deeper to this, but I would like to recommend you XGBoost paper. Again, here is the link. They really nicely describe all the derivative around. Uh, they use nice trick, uh, which is actually uh, approximation of, uh, of loss function with Tyler polynomial, and then they do their math and get, uh, get all the rules how to build the tree. Recommend you the paper. And um, now I would like to mention a few improvements uh, in the boosting trees uh, so far. Maybe a lot of you used XGBoost, which is quite like common, uh, common gradient boosted method. How many of you know or used XGBoost for your project? How many of you know uh, LightGBM and CatBoost? Just, okay, uh, a few people. So those are actually uh, the main things which are built by Microsoft and Yandex, the CatBoost is Yandex one. LightGBM is Microsoft uh, product, I would say. And they propose a lot of improvements uh, in gradient boosted methods. I don't want to just dive into this much, but I will just mention two of them. For example, uh, what was hard in the past is how to approach categorical features with gradient boosted methods. You could do some like one hot encoding of categorical features, uh, which is not a great idea. What those approaches uh, automatically do is it calculates kind of what is called target statistic, what it means. For example, you have categorical feature of uh, what, what, what is the city of the property you are trying to predict the sold price. And those approaches will take the, uh, the categorical feature of the city, let's say Brno, and will calculate the average price of the sold properties in Brno. And this is the target statistic. So each category in this categorical feature is replaced by this, by this average. But it has some catches. So, for example, when you have concrete example, you don't want to ingest its sold price to, to the statistic because you would be cheating, because you would ingest somehow what you are trying to predict into the features. So there are some like tricks which you uh, need to think about. Uh, and, uh, for example, I think CatBoost boost solves it automatically. Then there is a gradient one-side sampling, uh, which is actually approach which will really make your uh, training fast by selecting like subset of examples to build another tree. So you will just select the examples which has the biggest gradient and again it, it fastened up the, the training. So LightGBM for example is much faster than XGBoost from my experience. And there are uh, much more uh, ideas. I again put their reference to the papers. I think it's nice to read it. I don't want to just uh, kill you here by, by uh, talking about those uh, things here, which are really awesome. I recommend you to read it, but it's not time here for, for doing this. What is the problem with gradient boosted methods? And I'm getting to the last part of my talk here, is uh, that you know that it has a lot of hyperparameters, like how many leaves you, you want to have maximum in your tree, how many trees, what is the learning rate, what is the regularization. So many hyperparameters, like LightGBM have, have like 100 hyperparameters. So you want to pick some good setup. And at the same time, 
Uh, it's quite expensive uh, to run uh, your concrete model with concrete setup of uh, hyperparameters. And what I mean expensive here, it takes some time, uh, it takes some resources, it's not like in one second ready. So um, if you want to, you know, hyperparameters are usually, it has continuous domain, so it's hard to optimize it in this way. What you can use is hyperparameter optimization approach. We actually use uh, Hyperopt and Ray. These are two tools which we are using. So again, here is the reference. And I would like to just explain a high-level idea of, uh, of hyperparameter optimization. So what you want to have is some function uh, or some model. I, would, I will call it surrogate model, which actually represents uh, this expensive model which you have, uh, which you need really to train, and this surrogate model will try to try to predict what would be the loss of your expensive model for certain parameters. And uh, this surrogate model must be fast, like you, you really need to be able to evaluate it quickly. So this is, this is the point. Here, for example, we have some hyperparameter and the loss function, and the blue guy here is your, uh, oh my god, what I did. I will show you everything now. No. <laughs> uh, so um, the blue line here is your um, expensive, expensive model. You don't want to train every time. The red dots here are really like the, the samples of your training. So you, you spend some time waiting how it will end up, what, what, what would be the loss. And the orange line is your surrogate model which tries to approximate somehow what should be the, the loss uh, for your uh, expensive model for this, for example, for this parameter. In this example, I have Gaussian process uh, as, as this surrogate model. So Gaussian process is nothing more than multivariate Gaussian which is conditioned by these red dots. And when you sample from this multivariate Gaussian, you get actually functions. And those functions uh, always cross the red points because this, can, uh, this Gaussian is conditioned on those points. And you can sample it many times. And at the end, the mean of the functions is this orange line. And the, the light orange area is, is the confidence of, of your surrogate model. And this is how you, you can try to model uh, your expensive uh, like GBM or XGBoost model. Uh, the second thing you need is kind of function uh, which take this, this fast, uh, I would say cheap Gaussian process and will propose you uh, next parameter to try, next setup of hyperparameters. So this function, expected improvement, tells you, okay, this area here, this, this point here, uh, it's, it's parameter which is expected to improve your best, uh, best results so far the most. And then uh, when you set up, uh, uh, set up the uh, optimization, you will just uh, use this guy to select uh, intelligently some new hyperparameters. Then you will need to produce this red dot which takes time. And then you will update your modeling which will help this function to pick another point where to sample. And after some time, you will get, hopefully, to some semi-optimal semi -optimal, uh, posi position and setup of parameters. I was super su surprised how well it works, actually. So I would like to show you some uh, real experiment I did for you uh, to just demonstrate uh, how it's powerful. So. Uh, I prepared a data set, which was our training data set with the salt properties, and I kept there only a few features, like uh, was the size of the property, how many rooms it has, and you can imagine a lot of structured features like this. And I call it weak data set. <coughs> then I prepared another data set, which was weak data set, enhanced by one extra feature, which is quite nicely correlated with, with the salt price. So it's like, it has a really like strong predictive, uh, predictive property. And then I try to train a weak model on, on a weak data set and strong model on a strong data set and compare how the hyperparameter were, if, if the hyperparameters were different because, you know, the data sets were almost similar but one feature 
So I was quite curious if it would be different also with the hyperparameters, or if it would be close and so on. So I, would, I will show you only one, uh, one example here. All others have the same message. So uh, let's have a look on this. Number of leaves, maximum number of leaves of, of, of the tree of, of the forest. Uh, I sampled from this kind of distribution. So here, here is num number of leaves uh, from zero to like 1,200, which I could pick for my model. And here are the results. So the baseline, I took actually some baseline setup from uh, scikit-learn or whatever it was. It's like 31 leaves per, per tree. When I have a look on a uh, strong uh, model trained on strong data set, it, was ju it were just three leaves, which is kind of a huge regularization of your model. And this regularization is there because there is one strong feature. And now, uh, when we look to the weak model, it was completely different. It, it just tells the model, learn everything you want, overfit on it, please uh, just give me better results. And here is like 922 leaves for, for that kind of model. And I was really surprised, and I give you j just uh, some perspective to it. When you just, for example, see on Kegel competition, like problem which is similar to yours problem, and you see some nice hyperparameters which work for, for the similar data set you have uh, in-house, be sure that uh, you can find like better setup for your, for your modeling by far using these hyperparameter uh, parameter optimizations. I will skip this because uh, there is the same information. Uh, the strong model was regularized, uh, and the weak model was just forced to overfit, I would say. Um, just checking the time. Um, so when we look to the results, what is here? Um, here is the data set, and I will just do the step back. Uh, he, here we have the weak data set, and I try to evaluate baseline model train on the weak data set, so it's tuned to, to like the same data set we are talking about, and then strong model, which was, uh, which was, which op parameters were uh, actually set up for, for the strong data set, but I try to train the strong model on weak data set. And this number is median absolute percentage error of the prediction, so what it is, uh, I will take, take the data set, try to do the prediction of salt price, calculate how much uh, the prediction is off from, from the label, and then uh, take the median of, of, uh, of those percentage, so it was in median 7.2, and you can see that, that the big data set uh, Weak model trained on weak data set has the best results uh, from those three. The similar is actually here. So takeaway is really customize every model specifically on your data set. It really works and it's nice. We are at the end. So let me just wrap up for you what I was talking about all, all the time here. First. Maybe the most important, just uh, I know, just pick uh, pick the right product for for your effort, and uh, just don't don't um, focus on, only on technology. It won't just uh, work. Make uh, clean your features. Try to unify them. Uh, work on explainability. Uh, be aware of uh, this cheating, spe specifically when you work with time. Try to simulate your production as, as much as you can. Um, have a look on fast AI. Generally, there are good ideas. I, I mean, uh, with neural networks, uh, just the hacker ones. So uh, it usually works in a, in a, in a production. Uh, take care about your categorical features, uh, and I mean. Uh, build the, the rich embeddings. Uh, again, if you have a lot of categorical features, uh, it, can, it can help. And uh, optimize your models specifically for a data set. Even if, if it's different with one feature, the hyperparameters can be really different and the results can be really different. That's it. Uh, next time, I hope I will come with some production lessons learned. And the last but not least, I would like to invite you uh, to the reading group. Uh, we have here the office in Impact Hub. And next Friday, 
11.30, so it's before, before lunch. I would like to invite you to, uh, to enjoy a reading group with, with us. Uh, I try to organize it, uh, reading groups in each company I, I, um, I was part of. And I think the, what works actually is that when people meet each other on one place, bring just the paper they read, stand in front of the table, talk about the paper, enjoy time, like explaining each other what they understood, what they don't, didn't understood. And even if you didn't understood nothing, it's great to come and raise the questions because the next time you can, can be the expert who will help us to understand something and other. So uh, let's try to build this like community thing. I would be super happy if anybody of you will come. No registrations needed, just ask about the simple finance office and, and just knock on the door and enter approximately at uh, 11.30. For the first time, I picked this paper, which was really recommended by Andrew NG, uh, guided deep learning on mathematical equations, and uh, specifically about uh, they try to train models to do the integration and derivation of functions. And they were actually better than than MATLAB, so it, it sounds crazy. I didn't read it, I just checked the abstract. So uh, hopefully it won't, won't be crap. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Thank you.